All right. <clears throat> so here we are at the record player. And what we're going to do is we're going to investigate some of the reasons why we would want to use an animation controller or uh, alternatively called a state machine uh, for handling uh, something as simple as a record player. Um, well, the main reason is because, well, the, the, the state machine or an animation controller gives us a lot more control over the way animations end and the way we're going to go ahead and trigger them. Okay, so for something like a record player, as deceptively simple as it is, it's actually kind of complicated um, because we need to be able to control when the, 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 the playhead moves to the record, we need the record to continue to spin. And then when the record player stops, we need to move the head off. And we don't want to have weird breaks in our animations. We want it to be very consistent and smooth. Okay, so we have to basically cue each of the three animations exactly where we want them to be cued. And we, it would, we could do it with logic, but it would be just a much more complicated job. Um, and for something like, like controlling animations, an animation controller is going to do a far better job than trying to figure it out logically. Um, so, so there are good reasons why we're going to use a state machine for this. Now, a record player is an extremely simple um, form of an animation because we really only have three animations that we're triggering, but that also leaves it as a very good introduction to why we're going to be using the state machine. And for someone who's coming to this new, um, starting with a really big complex like character or something like that might be a bit overwhelming. Whereas a, um, whereas, you know, something as simple as a record player is going to really show you the power of the state machine. Uh, while not making it overly complicated and hard to grasp, okay? So that's why we're starting here, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at the animations and how I've set them up in Maya, all right? So let's jump over to Maya and let's just take a look, okay? Now here we're going to see that I basically have uh, an animation that goes from here to the playhead putting down. Once the playhead puts down, we're going to go ahead and do a full rotation. And then from the full rotation, we're going to go ahead and pick the playhead up and we're going to put it down. Okay, so if I were to grab any of these parts, we can actually see our, our cues. I do a little bit of a speed up here, which is why you see these extra keys. I wanted it to kind of smooth into a full rotation. Um, so this is actually the full rotation, I believe, is actually it is from here to here. I've just done a little bit of smoothing to make it feel a little more controlled. Okay, and at the same time, I'm moving the playhead. Okay, so the playhead rotates over and puts down. Exactly at frame 60 is when our animation is going to make the full loop. Now this is where the record player will do its um, continuous cycle. Okay, so it's just going to keep looping here. Okay, so um, this is going to be the start, this is going to be the loop, and this will be the end. Now the really important thing to note here is that at the 60 and at 114, I've got a complete cycle. Okay, so it's going from this position back to the same position again, and it makes one full rotation, okay? And that's where we're going to do our loop, okay? Now, the reason that it's important is that at the put down, or at the end of this animation, is where we want that one to begin, okay? So if you notice, it's a perfect transition, okay? It just transitions beautifully, and then makes another uh, continuous, um, and it also transitions perfectly at the end here, okay? So we always are going to make sure that this loop lines up nicely with the way our playhead now comes off the record. Okay, it's a very subtle thing, but that's what's going to keep us from having like a weird jump uh, when we cue the one from the other, or when we cue the loop animation from the, um, from the playhead putting down. And it's also going to cue beautifully when we uh, stop the loop and go to the uh, turn off animation. Okay, so that's really the only important thing to see here in the uh, animation and the um, game exporter. We'll see that I've basically done exactly what I was saying. Uh, we've got the record player start, which is from 0 to 59. The record playing, in other words, the loop, uh, is going to be from 60 to 114. And the record stop is going to be from 114 to 183. Okay, so that's our full cycle of animations. Okay. And uh, that's really it. That's, that's really what we're doing here, and there's not much else to see. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump back to Stingray. 
and let's just take a look at uh, what we're going to be dealing with. All right, so as we can see, once imported, we're going to have the record player, we're going to have our animation clips, and this is all the same as what we did with the doors. Now, you'll notice, though, that we also have this new icon here, and that is the, uh, the animation controller. Okay. Now, to create an animation controller, you're going to go right-click, Create, Animation Controller. Okay. And when you do so, it'll create a new animation controller. You can name it whatever you'd like. For me, I named it Record Player. I'm going to cancel that, but it would have created this icon for you, and you can name it whatever you would like. Okay, so let's go ahead and double-click on the Record Player State Machine, or the Animation Controller, and see what we're looking at. All right, so once it's opened, uh, you're going to be presented with a brand new interface. Um, now, this interface is basically what we're going to use to control all of the animations and all of their states. Um, that's why it's sometimes called a state machine. So each one of these little blue guys are going to be your animation states. And these lines connecting them are going to be the events. So what we use is an event to tell when to go from one state to another state. And that is the entirety of what the state machine does, okay? But it's a little more complex than that. Um, and we have a lot of controls in here that I want to go through briefly, but I do want you to understand that at its core, the state machine is a very simple thing, okay? It goes from one state of animation to another state of animation, and it gives you a little bit of extra control on how you're going to transcend from one state to another state. Um, and these events are what we're going to use to do it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's really quickly back up a second and let's just see what we need to do to get our animation controller to work properly. Now, when you first create an animation controller, it's going to need some basic properties to know how to work at all. Okay, so what you want to do is select this animation controller and if you were to create a brand new state machine, it would, it would ask you for these right at the start. Okay. Um, and that's why I want to make sure that I cover this, because otherwise you might be a bit confused uh, moving into this for the first time. Okay, so your skeleton is going to be the skeleton that gets imported when you import any animations uh, into Stingray. And that is a requirement of the state machine. It needs to know what skeleton to use. It also needs to know what preview unit to use. And the preview unit is going to be the same object that you care to do your animations to. So that's going to be your preview unit. And the preview level is simply what it's going to use up here for its preview level, okay? So if we change this, it, you know, you can change it to main and you'll get uh, a different background. I usually keep it on the empty, um, which is uh, right here, empty level. And that's kind of the default or what I consider the default, okay? Um, we also have this preview window. And one thing that's nice to know about in this preview window is you're gonna wanna set this to update mode always. Otherwise, you might find that your animations aren't playing right. So I always leave it to update always. And then when I click my different um, events, I can make it do as I want and everything works as I expect. Okay, this way I can really see what's happening. Um, so so there, that's, that's the basics, okay? And these are your different events. And when you trigger them, so this is a, a way to quickly preview how all of your states are functioning. Okay, so we can go, you know, start playing and stop playing. Now these events are going to be relative to the events that you create in your events folder. Okay, now you can create new events, so I can go add new animation event, and I can call it test. And when I save, you'll see that I now have a test event to work with. We're not connecting it to anything yet, so it's not going to be doing anything yet. Um, in fact, we're actually just going to delete this, because that's all you really need to know is how to create the event. Okay, so I'm going to delete that animation event. All right, great. So once you have animation events created, you need to be able to bring in animations. So these are your different animations. And we call them animation states in here because they're technically um, a little different than an animation because they're going to have more controls. Um, but they're, they're, they're technically just animations. And to bring them in, all you would do is drag one of your animations into the state machine, and it would then be part of the state machine. Okay, and you would now be able to control it with different events. So if we wanted to, we could go from empty and click on it, and then click on the new um, animation that I just dragged in, and now it's going to be saying, okay, well, I don't have an event yet. Okay, so that's why it's a red line. Okay, so if we select the event, we can just go on, start playing, 
and now it'll start playing this animation named off of this event that we've created up here okay so um, so it's really straightforward once you get the basic ideas uh, but it is a little it is a little something to get your mind around so don't don't be don't be upset if it takes you a second to figure all this stuff out it took me a while in the first time that I dealt with it too um, it is it is a lot to absorb it's basically like a whole new program that you have to learn um, so be easy on yourself and uh, take your time and try to figure it all out uh, there's also some really good documentation on the doc site um, we're gonna connect that link to you right now so you can go ahead and take a look at that link if you'd like um, but I will go through most of the basics uh, with you right here and right now okay so um, so again we're going to have events, and events trigger animations. Okay, that's really all you have to know, uh, really, in the, on the deep level in this uh, in this um, in this part of the tutorial. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. So what I've done here is I've created these two events. I've got to start playing, and I've got to stop playing. Now, again, the record player has some interesting qualities. We want to start the playing, and then move immediately when it's done into the loop, right? And then when we hit stop playing, we want it to know to wait to the point where the, the loop is complete to move out of the animation so that it's always smooth, okay? And how we're doing that is we're going to be using uh, the start playing event, and that's the easy one, right? So we're just going to connect um, the empty state. Oh, I'm sorry, I should explain the empty state. Uh, the empty state is simply a null, right? We're not doing anything there, okay? So we'll, this is in the scene by default, so um, we're going to utilize that. It's basically like saying, I'm not doing anything right now. And I use that as my, my stopped point, okay? Or when I don't want to do anything with it at all, okay? So that's what the empty is for, uh, when you're not doing anything. So from not doing anything, I want to go from there to the, the start of the record player or the, the start animation. Um, and when I do that, I want to use an event to do it. And I'm going to use that event called start playing. So when start playing is triggered, move to the start playing animation. Okay, pretty straightforward and pretty obvious. Um, and then we're going to use the, the record start animation to control how we're going to move to the next one. So if you notice here, it's set to animation end. And if you look in our events, there is no animation end event. Okay, that's because the animation end event is always available to us. Um, you can just drag it out and you will uh, always have that event. So if I were to take this animation end uh, event and delete it and drag it here, you'll see that in this list, I have animation end right at the top. Okay, and again, that is a default action. So we can always use that and we will use it often. That is why it is a default event because you're going to use it commonly. Um, and unlike these where you have to trigger them, this one was going to work automatically. Uh, as soon as this state is complete, we're going to move into the start. Uh, we're going to move into our next uh, event. Okay, so that's basically how that's going to work. So we're going to set that to animation end. And what that's going to say is when this event or I'm sorry, when this animation is complete, move to the next one. Okay. Now, there are some special properties that we can set in the uh, animation end, or actually in any of these, we can set some different modes and different controls on how we want the animation end to be triggered. So within each one of these events, we actually have some extra controls. What we can do is we can set these to be um, controlled by different means. In other words, this will do it on immediate. So as soon as this ends, it will immediately go to the next one. On wait end, if we were to put like, let's say stop playing and set this to immediate, and we were to now try out our animation, we'll see that it's not going to work the way we really wanted it to. It's going to do it immediately, but we want it to wait for the end of the loop. So watch what happens. See how it just did that quick weird backup? That was because it blended to an immediate switch. So it immediately switched and blended between them. But we didn't really want that. We wanted to wait until it lined up exactly where we wanted our animation to end. So in this case, we want to set it to wait until end. And now what's going to happen is it's going to wait for that loop to complete before it moves to the next one. Okay, so now if we go start playing, 
and then press stop playing, it waits until it's at the correct position. So let's try that one more time, and I'm going to do it right away. Notice that it took a while before it moved the playhead out of the way. That was because it waited for the end of that loop to complete. Okay, So that's a really useful tool. You want to know about that wait until end. Um, there's many times where you're going to want to utilize that. Okay, Now, um, once that was completed, um, and again, that happened on the stop playing action. Okay, so we went from here to here and we waited for the event stop playing to do it. Okay, then once that did it, it went to record player stop. And then when the animation ended, it went back to the empty state. Okay, so very, very straightforward, but gives us a lot of control and power. Now, there's one other thing to know about in the state machine. Now, if we look on record player start and record player stop, we've got um, cues here again. And if we look at our flow event, we'll see we have turn on light and we have turn off light. Okay, so these are our two events that we've set within the animation timeline. So at, just like we did in the, in the door animation where we wanted to trigger audio at a very specific point in time, we can do the same thing here. And again, these are just output events. So this is going to go to your flow and you're going to have now a hook that you can use to trigger things at a specific point in your timeline. Like, let's see what happens. Um, so I have this flow event connected in code, or in flow rather, uh, to my light fading in and fading out uh, um, logic. Okay, So when I hit start playing, we'll see that it slowly fades up right when I start. And if we look at this animation, right when it starts up, it starts. So if I were to go ahead and set turn on light to something more like 30, and then hit save, and now hit the start playing, we'll now see that the light didn't fade up until halfway through the animation. Okay, And when we hit stop playing, so this just gives you a very powerful way to really fine tune where you want events to be triggered within your animation state. So there you have it. Um, very easy control of your, of your animations with the state machine. Um, I hope you grasped all that. Again, you can take a look at the website. Um, and and do a little more further research if you want more details. We're going to go into more of the state machine later, uh, but you should have a basic grasp of what we're doing in here by now. Okay, so uh, try to try to comprehend everything that we just we just went through. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and start to look at the logic uh, that's driving our record player. Now. <clears throat> I know we just talked about the state machine, um, and we're going to get back to that in a moment. Um, in, in fact, we're going to all all of what I'm about to show you is going to be driving towards using those two animation events that we created: the record player start and the record player stopped. Um, however, to get there, we really need a function to be able to trigger uh, the animations. And in this case, I decided that I wanted to do something a little more exciting, which was a raycast. Now, what a raycast is, is when you draw a line from one point to another point and then test what it intersects with. Okay, so that's the effective uh, idea behind what a raycast is. Um, what we're going to use is our camera, and we're going to test the location and the rotation of the camera to give the raycast a direction and a position. So. From those, we're going to then ascertain, am I touching the, the record player? And if I am touching the record player, then I want to be able to click on it and then do an action, which is going to be trigger those events. Okay, So I just wanted to give you a heads up on what's actually going on under the, under the hood here uh, before we even started looking at the logic. So let's go ahead and now look at some of that logic and see how we're getting to the answers of that. Because a raycast is a kind of complicated thing on its own. Um, you know, the triggering is kind of complicated. I just wanted to have a little bit of background before we even started looking at the, the flow. And you'll understand why it's a little bit complicated when we open it up. Okay, so I'm opening it up now. And uh, the first thing that I had to do was I had to give the raycast something to collide with because it only collides with physics actors. Okay, so what I did was I selected the body and I went and created this physics actor. I left it as static. And that was really all I had to do, okay? So if we look in here, I've got the record player body in here. Yeah, there's the body. And I just went right click, 
create physics actor, I created my physics actor body, and I was able to move forward. Okay? Now, when we look at the unit flow, we're going to see a pretty complicated situation. Okay? It looks complicated at the start, but I promise you it's not so overly complicated. Okay? Um, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of break it down one step at a time. So the first thing we had to do was create a ray based on the camera, camera facing direction, just like it says in this, in this uh, little group dialogue. Okay? And I use this often, okay? and I would highly recommend to um, you know, go into the, to the project and actually copy this and use it again, um, because it's something you're going to want to use a lot, or at least remember where it is um, and how to get to it again, because this is something you're going to want to use really quite often. It's a really nice little function. Um, and it's really quite straightforward to put together, but rather than having to put it together all the time, just copy it and use it again. Um, nonetheless, I want to go through really quickly what we're doing. Okay, so the first thing we do is we grab the active camera. Okay, so this get active camera node will say to the engine, which active camera is, you know, which is the camera that which is active, and it'll output the camera and its unit. Okay, so from that, we can then uh, do things like get its position and get its world rotation. Okay, so let's let's do that really quick. So we're going to go camera, get active camera, and then we're going to go camera, get world position, camera, get world rotation. So these are the ones that we're going to need. Okay, and then we're just going to select the camera and connect it to the camera. Okay camera to camera, unit to unit, and unit to unit, okay? So that's the beginning of what we have here, okay? Then we're going to want to be able to get what is forward to the camera, okay? Because that's all we really care about is which way is forward so that when we draw our ray, it's going in the forward direction, okay? Because this, this ray is going to be looking for what position am I coming from and what direction am I going. So we want the direction to be forward of the camera, and we want the position to be the position of the camera. Okay, so let's take a look at how we would do that. So we're going to go right click, and we're going to go uh, vectors. So that's under math, vector, vector from rotation, or vector, yeah, vector from rotation. And now we're just going to connect the rotation to the rotation, and we're now going to have a forward vector. Okay, now the position is straightforward. We're just going to connect the position into the raycast, okay? So to get the raycast, we're going to go right click, physics, world, raycast, okay? And this is going to give us our raycast node. Now, before I said that we had to set an actor and we wanted it to be a static actor, so our object type is going to be statics, okay? And we're going to go forward is going to be the direction. The position is going to be the from, and we don't need a collision filter in this case. Um, now the length is very important, and that is how far will it test, okay? And in this case, we want it to test infinitely effectively, so we just set that to a very high value. Um, if you wanted to test only things that were very close to you, you could lower that number, um, so you have a little bit of control over on your length. Okay, so we're going to set that to, you know, like 1 million or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, and now we need to know when to do this test. Okay, so when are we going to be testing for the raycast? And the, for, for this situation, we're really going to want to test for it every single frame. Okay, so let's go ahead and go uh, event, level update. Okay, and with level update, we're now going to test it every single frame. And that is one of the most powerful little utilities you could ever create for yourself. Um, because now you can always test what you're looking at, or do actions off of what you're looking at, or do a whole slew of different things. Really, really powerful little set of utilities right here. Um, and can do so much for you. You can do so many cool things with this. Um, this example is just one of them, but you can do lots. Where later on we're going to you know, move the the um, the fan switch uh, with it. So, uh, but you can do a lot of different things. You can push things with it. You can do a lot. Okay. So let's just uh, delete that now because we have it below. Um, but that's how you build it. Okay. So this is now going to create a ray from your camera to whatever you're looking at. However, 
we don't have any logic to be able to know what it intersects with. So what we want to know is, am I looking at the record player? Is what I'm looking at and making a connection with equal to the record player? So here is where we're going to do that test, okay? And we only want to do that test when we press the mouse button, okay? So we have a new action on this compare objects, and we're just going to do that when we press the mouse, okay? So to get this compare objects node, we're going to go right click, and we're going to go flow control, and we're going to go compare objects. Now, you can plug almost anything into this compare objects node, and it'll compare anything to anything. And it's a really useful node, because in this case, we're going to be testing to see if the unit spawned is equal to the unit that is hit. Okay, so as you can see here from the Raycast, when we make a connection, it's going to output this unit. Okay, um, and if that unit is equal to the unit spawned, which in this case is our record player, right? So we're building this inside the, the unit flow of this unit. So what happens with unit spawned is it says this output of unit is really my unit, okay? And my unit is equal to record player. So we want to know if the unit hit is going to be equal to the record player. If it is equal to the record player, then we're going to go ahead and do some actions. But we'll get to that in a moment, okay? So I just want you to really understand what's happening there, right? Right there is really important because that's where we're testing to see if the object hit is equal to the one that we want to work with, okay? So, um, so effectively, that's, that's it. So let's just run through this one more time. Okay, so get active camera, get the world rotation, look forward, okay? Draw a ray from the camera forward. If that happens to intersect with the object that is the unit spawned, which in this case is our record player, and the mouse button is pressed, then we're going to go ahead and say it's equal, okay? Because this unit spawned is equal to what we're looking at. And when it's equal, we're going to go ahead and do a simple toggle, okay? And the toggle is what's going to actually fire off our animation events, okay? So those animation events are what we got in our state machine. Okay, so start playing and stop playing. Here are those two animation events. And those are what we're going to be firing when this is toggled. Okay, so when you click and it's looking at the object, then we're going to go start playing. And the next time you click it, it'll say stop playing. And then the next time you click it again, it'll say start playing. Because the toggle event effectively just gives an, a different output on each time. So the first time it's clicked, it's going to go to the odd. The second time it's going to get clicked, it's going to go to the even. The third time, odd. Fourth time, even. So each time, this is just toggling back and forth, just like the name describes. Um, so to get that node, we can go right-click, flow control, toggle. Okay, Really useful little, uh, little simple piece of logic right there. So the toggle node's great. Um, okay, now what we have here is the send animation controller event, okay, and that is specific to the event that we call in our float in our animation controller. So let's go ahead and go animation, send animation controller event, and here we can set whatever event we want. In our case, we're going to want it to play start playing. Okay, so the start playing event is going to be fired every other time we click. And we would do the same exact thing with the stop playing. Okay, so we could do that again. We could go right click, animation, send animation controller event, and we're going to set this one to stop playing. Okay, and from here, the animation controller will handle all the work. It'll be effectively the same as pressing these buttons, start playing and stop playing. Okay, so that's basically what these two are going to handle. Start playing and stop playing. Okay, so those are
tying now back into our state machine, okay? And from that, I'm then just triggering the audio, okay? Um, really, there's nothing to it. It's just saying, you know, play this audio, play the music start and play the music stop. Very straightforward. Um, again, I don't really want to get into audio too much. Um, I might end up doing a WWI's tutorial later on, uh, but for now, um, if you don't know how to do the audio, it's really not too critical. Um, uh, I'll, I'll do a, a tutorial on the audio creating triggers and creating all that stuff later. It's just way too big of a thing to get into right now. Um, for now, just know that you can trigger your audio from these animation controller events if you want to. Okay, This is basically when you have an in and then an out, that's effectively the same as doing this. The only difference is it's happening in sequence. Okay. So, uh, so just something to know. All right, so um, that pretty much concludes the triggering of our record player. And let's go ahead and see how that works. Now we're gonna get next into the light because I wanna show you how we pull these animation um, events out. But for now, I want you to see what this function just did for us, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save and I'm gonna go ahead and run my game. And let's take a quick look and see how it works, okay? So now, if I hit F2 to become walk mode, and I walk in, oops, gotta wait for the door to open. Ah. See, this is why I don't like that as the way we handle the doors. Okay, so now I can look at the record player, and if I click, my eye is looking at the record player, therefore the click is registered. And if I click again, it stops, okay? But notice if I look off to the side, and I'm sure you can hear me clicking, we don't see the record player start, okay? I have to look at it. Okay, so that's what all that logic did for us, all right? And uh, now let's go ahead and take a look at how I'm handling the little illuminated light, which we're not really able to see because I wasn't looking at it. But if I click here, you can see that the light is illuminating and it is turning off. Okay, so now we're gonna tie into the way that the animation controller is firing off the, uh, the light, okay? So let's take a look at that now. Okay, so what we want to do here is understand a couple things for this light, okay? Because this light is a little bit complicated. Um, what we're doing is we're driving a parameter of a material with a value, okay? So to understand what that really means is that if we look at this guy, we have this emissive intensity. And this emissive intensity has a value, okay? And the higher the value, the more it glows. Okay, so this is a drivable value. And what that really means is if we look at the material itself, okay, so all I did was I went to the material and now I'm looking at its parent, okay? Um, I didn't want to create a unique material just for this guy. I use this RMAEM material a lot. Um, and I often drive this emissive intensity. So I don't want to make it unique. So I just went to its parent and then I'm double clicking on the parent to be able to get to the flow graph of the uh, material itself. Um, and really all it is is it's a color map, a normal map. This RMA drives three different materials basically. Um, the R uh, drives the roughness. The G drives the, or the green channel. The red channel drives the roughness. The green channel drives the metallic and the blue channel drives my ambient occlusion. Okay, since these are all black and white, I can drive each one off of a separate channel. That's absolutely unnecessary to knowing how to do this next part of the tutorial. I just figured I'd explain what's going on with this material. Um, <clears throat> then what I have is I have an emissive map, uh, which is also RGB, and I'm multiplying it against an emissive intensity. This emissive intensity, I just simply call emissive intensity. And this parameter right here, this, line is the really important one that we care about. We have to know the name of the, uh, the material that we want to drive. And you'll see that in the logic, we're just going to be driving that material value. Okay. And we have an emissive intensity from zero to 10. Okay. So those are our two values that we can drive it to. We can drive it from zero to 10. We could raise this or lower it if we'd like, but I set it to zero and 10 to make it what I wanted. Okay. 
So 0 to 10. Um, and that will multiply against our emissive map, and the emissive map will then give us an emissive intensity that will grow. Okay, so that's the basics. And this, this node right here is really the only one we care about because this is the one that we're going to drive. We're going to drive this value specifically. Okay, so um, once you understand that, um, there's really not much else to understand here. Uh, creating them is not that hard. Um, if you wanted to create a node like this, you would just go right click, add, input, material variable. Okay, and then again, you can set this material variable, the name itself, is really the thing that's important. This node name is what it will appear as in here. So right now it says material variable. If I change this, it'll be now, um, let's say, test, okay, and save. We will now see that, um, I'm sorry, this node is now named test, okay? But the display name, if we name this now test, or let's call this uh, test display, and hit save, we'll now see that when we select the material itself, this is called test display, okay? Um, the name is what we're going to use in code to grab it or in flow, uh, either way. <clears throat> so this is, again, this line is the one that's really important, okay? And you can set this to vector 3, vector, you know, scalar. You can set this all different ways. Um, you can, I usually use the scalars, but if you wanted to adjust a color, you could do a vector 3. Or if you were doing something like adjusting uh, your uh, text coordinates, you could do that with a vector 2. Um, this is very variable, um, and I don't want to get into all the details of this. Um, it's just way out of scope. Uh, but basically, you just need to know that we have this value in our material that has the name uh, emissive intensity. Okay, so I'm going to delete the test. And so just so you're aware, anything that has one of these value inputs, you can control uh, dynamically. Okay, so we're going to control this number right here dynamically. And again, we're going to do it with this name. Okay, this is the important name. Okay, and again, it's a scalar value and it's from 0 to 10. Okay, so that's really all we have to know about the material itself. Um, but I did want to give you that quick run through of the material because it could be confusing if you didn't understand the underlying uh, ideas here. Okay, so, um, so that's it. And when we go to our object, you know, sliding that emissive intensity will, uh, will adjust my, my glow. Okay, so, um, so that's all I'm doing is I'm just really adjusting this number right here from 0 to 10. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so now that we understand that, let's go ahead and take a look at the logic of what's driving that, um, that glow. Okay, so back into the record player, back into the unit flow. Now this stuff down here looks really complicated, and it kind of is. It's not, it's not super straightforward, but it's pretty straightforward. So I think you should be able to follow along. All right, so what we have is... Um, the animation controller flow event. Now this is really what we're here to learn about, right? Like it's how to trigger, this is all part of triggering. So this is our trigger, okay? Now, if we look again at our animation controller, and we look at our record player start, we have this event called turn on light. Okay, and it happens when this animation begins to play. Okay, so that when this timeline runs over that, which is right at the beginning, this will start to play. Okay, which will, or, I'm sorry, when this starts to play, this will fire this trigger event. When the playhead runs over that, that, um, that event. Okay, so that will send the trigger to this animation controller flow event. Okay, so that's really the big important part. Okay, so try to grasp that. When the playhead hits that node or that little dot on the timeline, it's going to fire this event. Okay, so when that event is fired, it's going to go ahead and do a sequence of, 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 of logic. Okay, and that's what we're going to do. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and get this animation flow. Let's, let's recreate this whole thing. Okay, so the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to go event, uh, I'm sorry, animation, on animation controller flow event, okay? So that's what we need, that's the node we need, okay? Now once we select the node, 
we need to pick which of the animation flow events we want to grab. So that has to be based off of something. And in this case, we're going to want it based off the record player. And as soon as we do that, we're going to have our two, um, our two uh, events that we created in our uh, animation controller. And if we created more, they would be listed here as well. I just happen to only have two. I have the turn off light and I have the turn on light. Okay, so those are there now for us. So once we do that, what we want to do is we want to kind of just simply increase and decrease the value of a variable that will then be used to set the emissive intensity of the material. Okay, so that sounded like a whole mouthful, and I hope it wasn't su super complicated. Uh, but let's let's take a look. So. The first thing we want to do is when we turn on the lights, we want to make sure that the value that we're going to be adding to is set to zero because we want it to start from the off state. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go variable and we're going to set a numeric variable. Okay. And when we set a numeric variable, this is now going to be a number that we can just store. Okay. So when we turn the light on, we want to set the variable and we're going to name that variable. We'll call this. Uh, I have it named on the bottom emissive amount. We'll call it, um, we'll do the same thing. Emissive amount. Okay. And we're going to save the value into here. And the numeric value that we want is going to be zero. Okay. So we just set the value to zero. And that's really all we have to do. And we're going to store it in this container called emissive amount. Then we're going to go ahead and create a delay because we basically the delay node can also act as a timer or a, a switch that we can turn on and off. Okay. So what we're going to do is use this delay to our advantage. So we're going to go right click flow control delay. Okay. And now what's going to happen is when this out comes to the in, we're going to set our time to a very low value. So it happens really quickly and we can actually adjust how fast this will control. So we can make it a really slow fade up or a really fast fade up. If we wanted a fast fade up, we would just set this time to an even lower number. If we wanted uh, a very slow fade up, we would set it to a, a higher number. So like if this was one second, it would take a very long time for the, um, the loop to occur. If we take uh, this and make it a small value like 001, it's going to take a very rapid time for this loop to occur. Okay, so just just kind of hold that idea in your head for a moment. I know it's a little weird, uh, but yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in here. We're going to delay for 0.01 seconds. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set our numeric variable again. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So let's go m math numeric. And we're gonna, I'm sorry, we're going to go uh, variable set numeric variable. And we're going to use the same variable name that we used over here because we want the same container. We're going to be using the same container the entire time. Okay. So um, this numeric variable is going to be called emissive amount. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're now going to want this emissive amount to be a slightly less amount than it was when it was started. Okay, or I'm sorry, a slightly greater amount because we're turning the light on. So it's going to be increasing in value. So what we want to do is now add a little bit of a, an amount to this uh, to this variable. So we're going to go right click math numeric addition. And we're going to connect this to that. We're going to make this a value that's very small. Okay. And what we're now going to do is we're going to get the emissive amount variable. Okay. So we're going to go right click variable, get numeric variable. Okay. And this one is going to be set to emissive amount. Okay. And we're going to connect that to here. So let's just kind of run through what's happening right now. Okay. Cause this is, this is kind of cool. Um, so when the light is triggered, we're going to set the numeric variable to zero. Then we're going to delay for 0.01 seconds. And then we're going to add to that same amount because we're grabbing it from here. Okay. So we're getting the, the variable right here. So we're going to say, get the numeric variable and add 0.01 to it. So now this is equal to 0.01. 
So that's, that's, that's already started to increase the value of our, um, our uh, emissive amount. So slowly, it is, well, actually, it's only going to do it once right now. So it's going to go zero, it's going to go to time delay, and then it's going to go 0 0.01, okay? So it's going to be adding zero, because here's our initial amount. It's going to be adding 0 0.01, oops, it's going to be adding 0 0.01 to that emissive amount, okay? And then it's going to reset that emissive amount. So now this emissive amount is equal to 0 0.01. Then what we're going to do is we're going to loop back to the delay, okay? So once this is completed, it's now gonna loop it, which is now gonna go 0 0.02, and then it's gonna loop, and then it's gonna go 0 0.03, because each time it's gonna be adding 0 0.01 to the amount. So it's gonna go 0 0.04, 0 0.05, 0 0.06, 0 0.07, 0 0.08, etc. And it'll do that infinitely, okay? So this, right now as it's set, would just keep on increasing. It'll never stop increasing. As long as the, the program runs, it'll continue to increase. However, we want to have a stop, okay? So let's not do that yet, okay? Let's kill that, and let's do a compare numerics, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to go math, I'm sorry, flow control, compare numerics, okay? And what compare numerics is going to do is it's going to see if the values are equal, less than, greater, etc. okay? So what we want to do is connect this to the compare, okay? And now we're going to take our emissive amount again. So we're going to go variable, get numeric variable, and we're going to make this, you guessed it, emissive amount. And we're going to connect that to the A. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we could do it to A or B. Uh, it just doesn't really matter. Uh, then we're going to set the B to 10. Okay, so now let's analyze what's going on here. Um, and actually, let's, uh, let's just finish up the, the loop. So now let's go with the less back to our delay. Okay, so you know what, I'm going to move all this junk down here, just so it's not so actually, you know what I'll do is I'll move this down. And I'll move this up, just to give us a little visual room to breathe. Okay, let's investigate this one last time. Um, what's going to happen is we're going to take our, our light um, or our light trigger. It's going to be triggered by our flow event. That is going to set the amount to zero. So we're resetting our variable. Then we're going to delay for a microsecond. Then we're going to go to our emissive amount and we're going to add to the emissive amount. So the emissive amount was whatever it was. It's going to add 0 0.01, and it's going to reset that emissive amount to the new added value, okay? Then it's going to go ahead and compare this numeric. If the numeric is less than 10, it's going to loop, and it'll do it again. So each time, this value is going to constantly increase until we hit the 10, at which point this will no longer be true. It'll, no, it'll not continue to be less. It'll now be either equal to or greater, in which case, one of these would fire, but we're not firing anything out of there. So therefore, this would stop. It would effectively just stop in its tracks, and no more is this uh, functioning, okay? Now, the drawback is we're not actually updating the material yet. We have a variable that's increasing, but we haven't connected that to our material. So that's what we're going to be doing right here, okay? This right here is going to be doing that job where we set the variable to our emissive intensity of our material is going to now be set to the emissive amount of our variable, okay? So that's what we have to do now, all right? So let's go ahead and go through the a uh, actions of doing that. So let's go ahead and go right click and let's go material, get mesh, uh, we're going to need a couple of these. We're going to need the set material variable and our less is going to go into the in of that, okay? So that's going to be the, the action that finally sets the material variable itself. This is what actually does the job. But it needs some basic inputs. It needs to know the material, and it needs to know which variable we're going to be setting, okay? So let's go ahead and get the material. So we're going to go ahead and go material, and we're going to get, get mesh slot material. Now, the mesh slot material also requires an input, which is the mesh. 
So let's go ahead and connect the material to that. We got to find the name of the slot. So let's go ahead and find that slot. To do that, we're going to go to the materials tab and we're going to see that we need the record player material. Okay, we don't want the record material. We're not setting that. We're only setting the record player material. So let's go ahead and do that and let's go record player underscore material. Okay, so that's going to be our material slot. Okay, and again, you find that in your, uh, your inside the unit. Um, you find that inside the unit and its unit properties. Let's see if I can illustrate that a little better. Um, let's go ahead and go viewport. So each of these is using a material. And if we check the materials, it shows you which slots of materials this, this object is utilizing. So we need to grab the one that we want to affect, which is going to be our record player material. And this name right here is the, all we really need is that record player material. It has to be spelled identically though. Okay. So just be aware that you do have to spell it correctly. All right. So, um, so we're grabbing the record player underscore material. And now all we need is the mesh itself. So we're going to go right click unit, get unit mesh. Okay. And this will output our mesh. So here we can connect and the mesh name is going to be the mesh name of the part that we want to affect. In our case, it's going to be body because that's where the uh, affected material is. Okay. So, um, so that's really all we need. Uh, so this is going to supply the unit, the mesh, the body, and it's going to supply the material name and it's going to go ahead and set that variable. Okay. So we still haven't set the variable yet though. So we know that the material that we set was a scalar value, uh, variable. Okay. And we know that the, the variable name, right? So let's go ahead and check the variable name. We're going to select here. We're going to see that it's emissive intensity. So we want to make sure that that's actually the one that we're going to use. So let's double click on our material. Let's check our emissive intensity node and let's see what it's called. It is called emissive intensity with an underscore all lowercase. Okay. So let's copy that. And now let's go back to our unit editor. And let's look at this variable. We know that the variable name is going to be emissive intensity now. And I'm just going to scoot that out a little bit so we can see. And we want to set the scalar value to our emissive amount. So let's go ahead and go right click variable, get numeric variable. And we're going to supply the scalar value with emissive underscore amount. Actually, I don't think I put in the, I think it was just amount, right? Isn't that how I did it? Let's see. Yep. Emissive amount. Okay. So, um, so that's it. And now we have a tool to increase the value to a certain point and each time that it's less than, it's going to update that material. We don't need to update it once it's been set. So once this stops the loop, we don't need to set it anymore. It's already going to be 10. So we're good. Okay. Actually it'll technically be 9.99. Yeah. 9.99 or 9. Point, yeah. 9.99 is what it would be. Uh, because this 01, if we did this less than or equal to, it would, it would probably be perfect to get it to 10, but it doesn't matter a point oh no oh one is not going to make a difference so that's the uh that's the logic and that's how it works okay now to do the the retrograde motion or where we are going to make it subtract uh we're going to do exactly the same thing the only difference is we're going to change this value in the addition we're going to change it to a negative one and instead of comparing to see if it's uh less than 10 we're going to compare and see if it is greater than zero so here we're using the greater in, uh, output and we're testing to see if it's greater than zero. So again, if we want to run through this, when we turn off the light, we're going to set the value to 10 to start because that's the, the maximum. And what we're going to do is we're going to do that same delay. We're going to wait a moment. We're then going to do our emissive test. Okay. So, um, or our emissive uh, subtraction or addition. In our case, it's going to be subtra subtraction now because we're adding a negative value. So 
it's going to do the same thing. So now it's going from 10 and it's subtracting a little bit each time. Then it's going to hit this compare numerics and it's going to see is the emissive amount less uh, greater than 10? I mean, greater than zero? It is greater than zero, so keep making the loop, okay? Once it is no longer greater than zero, then go ahead and set the, uh, the, the, the materials again, okay? So each time we're doing the same thing, we're just doing them, uh, we're, we're doing the same function, we're just doing it with different inputs, okay? So this one's got a, a positive 10 instead of a zero because we're going to be subtracting the values um, and we're going to be going from 10 down, 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 down until we hit zero. And once that is no longer zero, it ceases to, ceases to run. Each time it runs, it will set our material variable uh, as it did each pass before. Okay, so, um, so that's basically it. Um, it's, really, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, it is kind of complicated, I'm not going to lie. Uh, we've got some pretty pretty funky stuff going on here, but um, yeah, go ahead and look at uh, the project and dissect it and try to figure it out, and you should be pretty much on your way. It is not so hard that it should be something that'll really break your brain. Um, just uh, just sit with it for a little while and dissect it, and you should uh, sooner or later get the answer that you're looking for. If I didn't explain it well enough, hopefully I did. Um, either which way, that will set our, our light and we should be good to go. All right. So let's now um, go ahead and give it a play and see what it does. Okay. So let's close this, save our changes. And I'm going to save my change again. And now I'm just going to go ahead and hit play. F2. And let's try it out. And as you can see, the light lights up and it will fade out. Now we can do some other things. Um, I should show you this really quick just because it's pretty neat. Um, with that function, we can do things. Oops, click the wrong unit. Let me go back to the record player. So what we can do is we can actually control a bunch of different things in here. Okay. So this addition is going to be um, one of the variables we can ad adjust. And the other one we can adjust is this time. Okay. We're going to use the time. So let's go ahead and say data, numeric data. And just to make it a little easier on ourselves, we're just going to make it so that we can affect one at a time. Okay. So we're going to go into this time value. And we're going to go math, numeric, multiply. And this is just a really easy way to manage uh, these kind of things here. So I'm going to multiply this by negative 1, which will invert the value. And now I'm going to put this into this one. Okay. So now I can just set it right here. I can set this to uh, 0.01. Or actually, let's make it 0.1, just to make it really slow. Um, and let's go save. So this is now going to change the speed of our delay. Oops, I totally goofed that up. Um, yeah, let me do that over again. Let me get rid of this. We're just going to put this into here because we're not affecting the negative value at all. Negative 0 .0, uh, 0 0.1. Oops. Negative 0.1. And that'll work. Okay, so all we're, all, I'm sorry, all I was doing is I'm just affecting the time, okay? So we're increasing the duration of this delay, okay? And let's see how that ends up working out. Um, let's uh, close this, save, and let's give it a whirl. And we should see now, just going to use fly mode because it's a little easier to do. Uh, let's walk. Hit the play, and we should see that that fade takes a much longer time, and it did. So if I stop it, we'll see that that happens again. And you can see how much longer it took to delay to fade that out. 
right? Like really, really long time. So, uh, so not necessarily the best thing to do, but it just shows you that you do have controls with this, um, with this time value. You can really affect how fast things fade in and fade out, and you can do a lot with this. Okay, so let's put this back to 0.01, and we'll call that uh, a complete wrap here. Um, so that's going to complete our um, our record player, and um, yeah. So feel free to ask questions in the forums, and um, I'll try to get back to you. Uh, also, you can dissect this model and this uh, this whole scene, and feel free to you know figure things out on your own too. So uh, so yeah. So that was just a quick walkthrough of how to make a record player do a bunch of different cool stuff. And we covered the state machine, we covered adjusting materials, we adjusted, um, we worked with a ray cast. If you uh, got through this tutorial uh, unscathed, you have learned quite a bit. So uh, pat yourself on the back and uh, feel proud. All right, so um, I will see you in the next part of the tutorial where we're gonna take it another step further um, and we're gonna do some more cool stuff. All right, we're gonna be doing the fans and adjusting fan speeds with um, with uh, with dynamic controls, so pretty cool stuff. All right, so I will see you in the near future, and I'll see you in part three. Talk to you soon.